Right, the uh, northern spotted owl is perhaps the most studied species in history. And there are literally hundreds of scientific papers um, on its biology. Um, when we entered this planning process, uh, we did not enter it in ignorance by any means. We had completed uh, in 2006 to 2008 a previous planning process that really developed a lot of the tools that we're using now for this planning process. Um, it is quite a complicated analysis. I want, I'm going to hit the high points tonight, but I want to give you a little bit of background on the basis of the analysis. It is based on clearly defined scientific based criteria. And some people, they say, well, why don't you manage, why don't you evaluate foraging habitat? Why don't you evaluate the effects of riparian habitat on spotted owls? And the reason is there are no specific science based criteria to evaluate against. Um, the standards that we use is not how habitat changes on the landscape, but how does the BLM under each alternative contribute to a landscape in Western Oregon that actually meets the conservation needs of the owls. So we are taking a very broad, large picture look at this analysis. Um, our previous planning effort told us where we could expect the development of large blocks of habitat on BLM lands the soonest that are properly spaced and the science is very clear that spotted owl conservation requires large blocks of contiguous older forest. Uh, we did, we, in the previous planning effort, we were unable to forecast population responses because we simply didn't have the technology. In the intervening years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and its development of the recovery plan and the final rule on critical habitat developed the HEXIM model. And so we borrowed that in its entirety and now are able to use that to forecast population responses to each of our alternatives. And then also the importance of expert review at all phases of the planning process. The very first thing we did with the spot owl analysis is convene a working group of federal scientists and biologists from various agencies. And these people advised us at all phases on, on the modeling. Um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, Betsy Glenn is their spotted owl biologist. Brendan, you just saw in the video. Uh, he oversaw uh, much of the conservation planning for the spotted owl. Ray Davis with the Forest Service does the, the monitoring of the spotted owl under the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, Nathan Shoemaker with EPA created the HEXIM model. Uh, we did a variety of internal reviews on the methodology, the results, and my conclusions. I convened all of the West Side BLM biologists, the people who are most familiar with the management of the spotted owl in the field, to do a top to bottom review. And also, Marty Raphael, Bruce Marco, Peter Singleton, all PhDs, um, all independent with the Forest Service, completely divorced from our planning process, all volunteered to do a top to bottom review. So we bent over backwards to make sure that this analysis is both analytically and scientifically credible. And many of the people that were involved in this process also were involved in advising the Fish and Wildlife Service on the development of the recovery plan and the final rule on critical habitat. In the previous planning process, we used habitat layers. And in this approach, this planning process, we used a very different approach of relative habitat suitability surfaces. These are geospatial computer surfaces. And they are at a scale of about 500 acres, um, which is the scale, the smallest scale at which spotted owls are known to use and select habitat. So they are far more representative on how owls are actually responding to habitat conditions as opposed to stand conditions. You could have a 300 year old stand and say, boy, that's really good spotted owl habitat, but if it's only 20 acres in size and in the middle of a plantation, it's of no value to the spotted owls. The relative habitat suitability surfaces look like a habitat map, but in fact, they are more representative of how owls are actually using and occupying habitat. Um, they are original to the BLM. They are range wide on all land use, on all land ownerships, not just the on the, they change at decadal increments, and at um, BLM administered lands, they're based on our Woodstock covariates. They, they incorporate ingrowth uh, treatment, forest treatment from both timber harvest and forest restoration and the effects of wildfire. And they vary by alternative according to the rule set of each alternative. On all the other lands, they're based on the Forest Service GNN data, 
They incorporate, again, ingrowth, timber harvest, disease, insects, wildfire, and they do not vary by alternative. They're the same under all alternatives because we model how habitat conditions change over time on all other land ownerships within the range. So the question is, when you ask, how does an alternative affect the northern spotted owl, exactly what do you analyze? Well, you analyze 20 things. In 1990, the Interagency Scientific Committee developed the first two conservation needs for the owl, and I'll go over what those are here momentarily. Then in 2006, following the, the 2006 meta-analysis, the one that showed the precipitous decline of spotted owls in Washington State and speculated that it was due to barred owl competitive interaction, the Fish and Wildlife Service developed conservation needs three and four. In 2011, 33 recovery actions in this revised recovery plan, of which four, these four listed here, would be affected by BLM uh, management decisions under the RMPs. And then finally, the 2012 final rule on critical habitat uh, identified special management considerations or protections, four for the moist forest, eight for the dry forest. Now, all of these have different origins, but they're all based on the science of the spotted owl, so you would expect a great deal of redundancy between and the fact is, by analyzing simply five of these conservation needs, one, two, four, and recovery actions 10 and 32, that provides about 98% of all the information necessary to inform our decisions on the others, or to evaluate the others, the consistency of the planning decisions with the other. So these are the five that I'm gonna go through tonight. Conservation need one. Spotted owls require large flocks of nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat distributed across the variety of ecological conditions and space to facilitate owl movement between and through the blocks. Um, there are specific criteria on what constitutes a large block, how it has to be the size of it, the, the habitat conditions within it, the, where it is on the landscape, and how it's spaced with other large blocks. And so, one of the things we did under the, the uh, RMP effort was we developed a no-harvest reference analysis. And this is an assumption, this is not an alternative. It simply assumes that the BLM does no forest treatment over time. There is no timber harvest, there is no forest restoration. We simply allow the forest to grow. The only thing that knocks it back is the occasional wildfire, which we model in this. And what we find is that in 2000, in current situations, the large blocks are the dark green blocks, and the light green areas are the spacing buffers around them to make sure to determine if they're spaced correctly. In the Cascades right now, large block development is perfectly adequate. Uh, these are, we have large blocks in all of the ecological conditions and they are spaced properly. However, even after 50 years of running this simulation of ingrowth, we are not able to connect to this large block that's in the northern half of the coast range. Uh, the BLM ownership is such and land conditions in there are such that we simply cannot affect that outcome. And as far as how the alternatives change under alternative uh, with respect to conservation need one, all of them are virtually identical. I put the maps in the RMP but you're not going to see a lot of difference between how they develop over the course of 50 years. And the reason for that is because we went in and formed from previous modeling, we knew where large blocks were capable of developing soonest, and we based all of our reserve designs on that configuration. What we discovered was that all alternatives reserved those blocks necessary to support large uh, habitat configurations. But once you reserve those essential configurations, reserving additional lands provides very little additional benefit for large block development. In other words, it's the spatial arrangement of large blocks that is key in this analysis. Under all alternatives, the BLM would contribute to a Western Oregon landscape that meets conservation need one. Of course, the single exception is that north half of the coast range where we simply don't have an, alter uh, an option to affect the outcome. Conservation need two is habitat conditions within and surrounding large blocks of nesting, roosting, and foraging habitat that support the movement and survival of owls between and, sure and through the blocks. Um, this is necessary for demographic support 
and then for the genetic interchange between isolated populations on the landscape. It is necessary to maintain the genetic vigor of the species and the survival of owls until, as they disperse from natal areas until they can establish a nesting territory. And we look at this in two ways. We look at simply the dispersal capable landscape. How does dispersal capable habitat develop under the alternative? And also we look at dispersal flux, which uh, pertains, it simulates owl movement and survival across the landscape. We, again, we have science-based criteria on what constitutes dispersal habitat and what quantity and spatial arrangement we need on the landscape to support movement and survival. Again, going back to the no harvest reference analysis, what we find is something very similar to what we found with the large blocks. Right now, the cascades are functioning very well with respect to movement and survival. Um, we're, in this image, we're concerned with the stippled areas inside the solid green lines, not the, light, the lightest green and lightest brown areas. Those are the areas that are capable of supporting owl movement across the landscape. But even after 50 years of simulation under no harvest, we still cannot provide connectivity to that patch in the northern half of the coast range. What is key in this analysis is there are two areas that BLM lands are capable of contributing to that are key to the movement and survival between physiographic provinces. The northernmost one, this one just south of Eugene, in the 1940s, uh, there used to be habitat conditions between the Cascades and the Coast Range beginning at the Canadian border and going all the way south through Oregon, Washington and Oregon. Right now, today, if you start at the Canadian border, this is the first bridge capable of developing between here and Canada. That's how habitat conditions have changed in the last 50 plus years. The other area, of course, is this north-south interchange that connects the Klamath with the Coast Range. Uh, these are two areas where the BLM planning decisions are quite essential in providing for connectivity over time. When we compare the alternatives, they break down into two groups. Alternative, the no action, no action alternative and alternative, sub-alternative B and alternative D do provide this connectivity bridge in the course of 50 years. All the other alternatives re retain that gap and that's the chief difference between the two groups of alternatives. We also evaluated dispersal flux and let me explain this map to you. If we zoomed in on these maps, you would find that they are divided into hex hexagon, a grid of hexagons, each 215 acres in size. And the color on these maps, we want run 100 replicate simulations of female owls moving across the landscape. And every time they traverse one of these hexagons, it gets a point. The areas that are dark purple, this is the decade, 2000, the first decade of the simulation. This is the final decade of the simulation. The dark green, the dark purple, this is area that essentially we're getting no females moving through during our simulations, 100 replicate simulations. The light purple at the fringe of the Willamette Valley, on average in 50% of the simulations, we're getting one female occupying those hexagons once during a decade. Um, so it's very marginal movement and survival. Then it goes all the way up to the red, which are 600 plus occupancies during the course of 100 replicate simulations. What is curious about this is when you compare the change between our current situation and in the future 50 years, as we saw in the previous analysis, habitat conditions improve, dispersal flux actually declines. And the reason for that is because as we get to conservation need four, we have a decrease in the owl population. Fewer females on the, uh, on the landscape result in a decrease in dispersal flux. The real revelation of this analysis is when you overlay the current habitat, current dispersal flux with the BLM landscape, what we find is that in the Cascades, most of the dispersal flux is confined up onto the Forest Service lands. The BLM is really at the fringe and not contributing much to dispersal flux in the Cascades. But when you get out into the Klamath and into the Coast Range, BLM becomes the major player in dispersal flux in supporting movement and survival across the landscape. 
That is where our planning decisions are going to have the most impact on the spotted owl. So conclusions for conservation need two. Alternatives A, subalternative B, and alternative D provide that better east-west connectivity. Uh, in the final rule on critical habitat, the Fish and Wildlife Service specifically identified that area as necessary for owl conservation. And again, we make the most important contributions in the Klamath and portions of the Coast Range province. Conservation need four. In areas of significant population decline, sustain the full range of survival and recovery options for the northern spotted owl in light of significant uncertainty. In 2006, when the Fish and Wildlife Service did its most recent species review, it identified continued habitat loss and competitive interactions with barred owl as the two greatest threats to the spotted owl. So we used the HEXIM, the service's HEXIM model, and to simulate owl movement and survival across the landscape, the establishment of nesting territories, the production of young and population response. So we look in, in with respect to conservation need to how does the owl respond to a changing landscape, changing habitat conditions on all lands, not just BLM lands, range wide, in the face of competitive interactions with barred owls. We look at the population responses, we look at extinction risk, and we do a source analysis. So these are the modeling regions that I'm going to be talking about just to orient you. The North Coast and Olympic, it's the northern half of the coast range in Oregon. It goes up in the Olympic Peninsula all the way up to Canada. The Oregon Coast Range is in Oregon, the southern half of the coast range in Oregon. The West Cascade South, which is basically the Cascade Range in Oregon. The East Cascade South, which is the southern portion of the planning area and extends down into California. And then the Klamath West and the Klamath East, both in Oregon and extending into California. That gives you a visual idea of where this modeling is done. And when we look at the results, this is strictly population response. If we start at the bottom, we're looking at the North Coast and Olympic and the Coast Range. The coast Range is the green, the North Coast Olympic is the blue. We're starting with fairly low populations right now. Those populations continue to decline throughout the simulation of 50 years. And in 50 years, we hold habitat conditions static to see if the population will stabilize. And in either case, does it? It continues to decline out to 100 years. In the eastern Cascade South, this area here, we see that we, again, start out with a fairly low population, but we get population stability up to 100 years. Now this line, this is the results in the analysis, but it's very misleading, and I'll get to that when I talk about population risk. If we go to the Klamath West and the Klamath East, these areas here, we find that the populations decline slightly for about the first 30 years, then they stabilize, and then they actually start to increase. That's the area where we get population stability. In the Western Cascades, we have the most robust population, but again, we get a steady decline through the 50 years, and it does not stabilize. After 50 years, it continues to decline. So let's look at population risk. Now, XM is a beautiful model, but it is not designed to fully account for small population processes, and that's because it simulates repro the reproduction by females that reproduce probabilistically. There are no males in the model. They don't form a pair bond. And what that means is that when we get to a very small population, you could have one or two females in a modeling region, and those, they could go on to reproduce in the model indefinitely, when in reality a real population would have crashed because of genetic isolation because they couldn't find a mate. So what we do is we set two thresholds, and this is based on population biology for each modeling region. When a population reaches 250 females, we considered it at risk. In other words, it reaches a level where an Ali effect begins to take hold. The genetic, genetic vigor of the population begins to decline. The female-male encounter rate uh, is reduced. You get internal mechanisms that, gradually, that start weighing and grinding down the population and eventually pushing it into extinction and is much more susceptible 
a stochastic event like a major wildfire. When the population gets to 100 females in a modeling region, we consider that de facto extirpated. We have lost the population. Even though the simulation continues to run indefinitely, once it reaches 100 females, we feel that we have lost the population in that modeling region. So let's look at the results. When we look at population risk, the probability of the population dropping under a no harvest reference analysis to 250 females and becoming at risk. In the North Coast and Olympic and the East Cascade South, we're about 90% probability that we are below that threshold right now. And that probability continues to increase over time. Remember the East Cascade South, this area in the previous model, it showed a steady of 200 females. Very misleading line. This shows that that population is already under considerable stress and is not expected to survive without serious management intervention. In the Oregon Coast Range, this area here, it reaches about a 50% probability of dropping below 250 females for <coughs> three years. Now keep in mind that these data that we're using in this model are about six years old. So the odds are we already have dropped below that population level and that population also is at risk. Elsewhere, in all the other modeling regions, there's less than a 5% probability of the population dropping to 250 females uh, within 50 years. When we look at ex extirpation risk, the probability of the population dropping to 100 females, de facto extinction, what we find is both in the coast range and the north coast and Olympic, we reach that threshold in about 30 to 35 years. Now, keep in mind these are simulations. We are not trying to make an a annual, a, a yearly accurate forecast. We're not saying that they're going to become extinct in 30 to 35 years. The value of this is comparing between alternatives. Uh, in all of the other modeling regions, less than a 5% chance of extirpation within uh, the next 50 years. Finally, we do the source analysis. And what this is, as the simulated females move across the landscape in 100 replicate simulations, this is where the young are produced. The blue, the, the cooler colors, the purple are the fewest, and the red are the most. Again, what we find is something very similar to what we found in the dispersal flux analysis is that over time, the sources decrease because fewer owls on the landscape means fewer young being born. And again, what we found similar to dispersal flux is when we look at the sources of where owls are actually being produced under current conditions, most of it is happening in the Cascades on the Forest Service lands. The BLM is not a significant player in the Cascades, even though we do have some breeding on us. But when we get out into the Klamath Basin and into the Coast Range, we become the major player. They, these are the key areas where we are going to affect owl conservation. So let's look at how population change by modeling region under the alternatives. And this is very revealing. All of the alternatives follow this line. This is the North Coast Olympic. This is the Coast Range. All of the alternatives follow the same trajectory. That is the projection under each alternative. All of the alternatives follow the same trajectory. When we took the no harvest reference analysis and alternative C, which is the smallest uh, reserve network of the, of the alternatives, and we modified the barred owl encounter rate, we had discussions with the Fish and Wildlife Service on if they were to implement a barred owl control program, what would be a realistic encounter rate over time. So we simulated that for the no harvest and alternative C, and it did change the trajectory on both of these. But look at this population decline under all of the alternatives. What that is telling us is that within the range of the alternatives, habitat conditions are not a limiting factor. The results are being driven entirely by competitive interactions with the barred owl. If we look at the West Cascade South, Again, all of the alternatives follow exactly the same trajectory, including the no harvest reference analysis. And when, in this case, in these two uh, modeling regions, the service actually predicts that even with a control program, competitive interactions with barred owls will increase simply because the barred owls are taking over those areas 
even with a control program in place, they expect that to elevate. So what we're seeing is a, only a very slight differenti differentiation, about three owls in the course of 50 years among the alternatives. And with a barred owl control program in place, again, continued decline, but very little differentiation among the alternatives. Statistically, these are all identical. It's only when we get into the Klamath West and Klamath East that we start to see a differentiation. Notice that the no action alternative, the continued management under the forest plan, performs worse. The Northwest Forest Plan was never designed for the dry forest management. The uneven age management and other provisions that we're putting in place now are much more beneficial to owl management in the dry forest. Again, all of the other alternatives and the no harvest scenario follow the same trajectory. And if we modify the barred owl encounter rate, we get a better result. This in the Klamath East is the only indication that habitat now becomes a limiting factor and we're getting a habitat influence among the alternatives. Again, it's only about five spotted owls over the course of 10, uh, 50 years, but we are starting to get a little bit of differentiation there. When we look at population risk by modeling region by alternative, the North Coast and Olympic, all of the alternatives, we start with about 90% probability it's below 250 females, and it increases to 100% under all alternatives and the no harvest reference analysis. This is a comparison of no harvest with and without the modified barred owl encounter rates, no significant differentiation. These results are being driven entirely by the barred owl. In the North Coast and Olympic modeling region, as far as extinction risk, again, all alternatives and the no harvest reference analysis reach an extinction, at, uh, an extinction at about 30 to 35 years. No significant differentiation among the alternatives. However, with a barred owl control program, we can extend that out significantly. And if we look at this in tabular form, Statistically, these are all the same number. They, they, it is not possible to really differentiate among these effects, but when we look at a barn owl control program, we can extend it out to 60 years before we reach extinction. In the Oregon coast <coughs> modeling region, we reach a uh, population risk two to three years. Again, no differentiation among the alternatives. Again, these are six-year-old data. We're probably already there. Uh, when we look at the extinction re extirpation risk, again, no differentiation among the alternatives, but with a barred owl control program, we can extend that out to more than 100 years. If we look at the probability of the population dropping below 250 females in the West Cascades South, very low probability, less than 5% under all the alternatives. In the East Cascades South, very high under all the alternatives. And in the Klamath East and West, less than a 5% probability that that population will drop below 250 females in the next 50 years. The source analysis, I packed all the source maps in the appendix, appendix S, for all the alternatives, they're identical. The, the result is being driven entirely by the bottom line. Moving on to Recovery Action 10. This has to do with the protection of known sites. We have 2,465 known sites associated with BLM lands in Western Oregon. And what we find is that right now, 59% of those are at Recovery Action 10 thresholds or better. And we increase that under all alternatives. You can see that under all alternative C, it has the lowest benefit uh, under no harvest alternative D and subalternative B, it has the best. But if you look at alternative B, which is the preferred alternative, it's very close up there. Looking at it in tabular form, we're getting about a 1% difference between subalternative B, which protects all owl sites, and alternative B, which provides no special protections for owl sites other than the land use allocations. And this shows the benefit of creating your reserve system, positioning it on the landscape. You get virtually the same benefit as if you were doing site-specific protection. 
Recovery Action 32 has to do with the protection of structurally complex forests. We modeled this two ways. We first was strongly selected for habitat, and we determined this statistically. On the, in Western Oregon, BLM lands, 12% of the landscape supports 72% of known sites, and that's what we define as strongly selected for. And it breaks out, if you graph it, you suddenly get a very cluster of the strongly selected for habitat. What we find is we start about 400,000 acres, and we get an increase under all alternatives. We also modeled it using our structural stages, uh, multi mature multi canopy and structurally complex, and we get essentially the same result. We start out with about 850,000 acres on BLM lands, and it increases under all alternatives, alternative C performing substantially worse than the others. So, the key points. We are dealing with a species that is under severe biological stress. Um, it is at risk of extirpation over significant portions of the range, and those risks are increasing. Uh, and there's very little that the BLM can do about it. We manage 4% of the habitat across the range is addressed by this planning process, and we simply cannot turn this around alone. And in fact, the BLM does not have legal authority to actually manage the barred owl, actually implement a uh, barred owl removal program. Right now, the Fish and Wildlife Service is engaged in a four-year study on the feasibility and effectiveness of barred owl control. And if they discern, decide that they are actually going to implement a barred owl control program, then I imagine that the BLM would be a cooperator. With <coughs> Those decisions have not been made yet. With respect to uh, habitat conditions, under all alternatives, the BLM would contribute to a Western Oregon landscape that meets the conservation needs of the owl. Now, the single exception to that is in that northern half of the coast range where we simply don't have the land ownership that we can affect the outcome. And of course, this does not address conservation need four, where we're getting the barred owl influence. Within the scope of the BLM alternatives, the spatial arrangement of habitat is the most important. Now, the science says that the quality and quantity of habitat is key to species survival. All of the alternatives are providing the quantity and quality of habitat that the BLM is capable of providing. But what we see is that alternative A, which has the largest reserve system, performs substantially worse than other alternatives that have much smaller reserve systems. Within the scope of the alternatives, it is the spatial arrangement where we are putting the large block reserves on the landscape that is most affecting the outcome. The BLM has wide decision space in the Western Cascades, again, with respect to dispersal, with respect to breeding. Much of it is occurring on the Forest Service lands above us, and we're not a significant player there. But when we get out into the Klamath Basin and into the Coast Range, we are a key player in both uh, <coughs> breeding and survival, and also connectivity between the Kalamath and the Coast Range and the Cascades provinces. And the BLM, finally, the BLM can more effectively implement recovery actions through planning decisions, such as the proper placement of reserve systems than through individual management actions. sampling error in this whole calculation. Well, again, as I said, when I look at these XM simulations, these are not intended to be accurate, numerically accurate forecasts. Their value is in our ability to compare trends and population changes by alternative. 
In other words, they are valid when we're looking between alternatives, how do alternatives compare? But we never were trying to make an accurate forecast of a population change in each modeling region over time. Now, that said, what these simulations are showing is exactly identical to what spotted owl biologists are observing in the field across the range. Nobody was surprised by these simulation results, but they are not intended to be numerically accurate. Now, those graphs that I showed, in reality, all of those lines should be very fuzzy lines because they're based on 100 or 500 replicate simulations, and those are means. And the reason I arrayed it that way is because it's more, it's easier to communicate that to people through a mean so they can show the differences. But in reality, all of those lines are fuzzy, and if I plotted them as they really are, you'd see so much overlap that you wouldn't really be able to distinguish anything. Uh, there is no substantive differences among most of those graphs, among the alternatives. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions for Eric? About Northern Spot Owl. Thank you, Jack. All right, I would like to know, how do you distinguish a mature, multiple canopy, structurally complex forest from a forest loaded with ladder fuel? Well, you could have structurally complex forest that is loaded with ladder fuel. Normally, a structurally complex forest it is, it is, has a fairly dark, a closed canopy, fairly dark forest, forest floor, and over time you are choking out ladder fuels. So you would not expect to find it. Now, how we define structurally complex forests in our classifications is with the Woodstock modeling. We go out and we have sampled all of our forest stands on all BLM lands in Western Oregon, and we also have uh, combined vegetation <coughs> survey data that, we can, that takes more detailed measurements and we coalesce that into the Woodstock outputs and the Woodstock out. Woodstock is, is a program that is able to simulate forest change over time under different habitat conditions. But the base information is all from field observation. Great. Question here and then Just to follow up on that, <clears throat> it seems like in the different alternatives there's a different definition of structurally complex. Some of them are 120, some are 160. So it would just seem like there would be one definition that mattered. Can you speak to what was used in the draft plan? We have two cutoffs. When we're talking about these reserve systems under the structurally complex under the different alternatives, we have two cutoffs. Uh, age, a stand age, is not the ideal <coughs> predictor of what constitutes owl nesting roosting habitat, but in general. In the moist forest, when a stand reaches 80 years old or older, it is becomes uh, nesting roosting habitat. That's the reason we started. The other is Recovery Action 32 under the fourth under the recovery plan talks about protecting structurally complex forests, but there is no agreed to definition of what constitutes structurally complex forest. So in some alternatives, we define it as. 120 years old, some 140, some 180, okay? Now, that is simply to compare alternatives, to have a range of alternatives to examine what the potential consequences are to the timber base, to owl conservation. That's why we did it that way. Now, in this analysis, when I talk about how, does we, how do we contribute to Recovery Action 32, I use the strongly selected four. That definition is consistent among the alternatives, and I also use the structurally complex from our stage classes, and that is consistent among the alternatives. Those are not dependent on age. Okay. All right, thank you. Doug? Um, I think I heard you uh, say that the decision to begin the control for the shooting of barred owls uh, had not been made yet. Our understanding was that it was to begin this fall in the southern part of the range and that decision had been made. Okay. Let's distinguish between a study, research project, oh. and an actual removal program. Last year, the Fish and Wildlife Service began a research program in one of four management research areas, the first one in California. This fall, they'll begin in two research areas in Oregon and one in Washington. It's a four-year study. 
<coughs> the intent is to determine both the feasibility and the effectiveness of a removal program. So it is a strictly a research project at this time to inform their decision making. After four years, when they have the data, they then can make an informed decision on whether they think a larger scale, an actual barred owl removal program would be feasible and effective. But that decision has not yet been made. The only decision that has been made is the Fish and Wildlife Service has initiated the research program. I just want to point out that we were joined tonight by Fish and Wildlife, so if you've got specific questions for Brendan White, he's here from Fish and Wildlife Service to answer some of those questions. Just a quick follow-up. If, if the decision has been made, how, how do you make your calculation of the 60 and 100 year viability of the, of the spotted owl based on removal of barred owls? Okay. Right now we have, uh, every five years, the scientists publish a meta-analysis. The last, the most recent one is 2011. That's why I say the data are six years old. And that has a barred owl encounter rate and the effect of barred owl on spotted owl survival. That's what we put into the computer modeling, is the actual observed encounter rates and the effect of the barred owl on spotted owl survival. To modify that, we talked to the Fish and Wildlife Service about what they thought would be a realistic change if they were to implement a barred owl removal program. And so we ran, repeated the simulations for both the no harvest reference analysis and alternative seeding. 